We'll continue now with the practical part. Um, Janitza Hackenbuchner from the Data Lit MT team will hold the first practical session and the topic is about MT specific data collection, MT training data preparation and MT model training using Python based Jupyter notebooks. Janitza, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so hello everyone to this first practical session. Um, I am very excited to start this one and I will be sharing my screen um, and as before I won't be able to see um, any faces or any chat comments or anything so if you do have a question feel free to just simply unmute, unmute yourself and just uh, interrupt me um, while I'm speaking that's really fine this is, that's what this is supposed to be about so um, don't worry um, or you can post it in the chat and then maybe Andrea or Ralph can um, can tell me as well. Um, yeah, we'll, because, we'll keep an eye on the chat. Yeah, so just in case, because I won't see it. So just um, perfect. Then let me just share my screen. All right. So um, as we'd already mentioned before, um, in this uh, practical session, I will run through two notebooks. So on the one hand, the notebook for MT data preparation, um, data planning and data collection. And then in the second notebook, we'll start training an NMT engine and discuss sort of the important aspects of what is needed. Um, there will probably be a very mixed skill set in the audience. So some of you might have already um, coded before or worked with uh, data in this aspect with MT data or um, trained your own system even. So I will try to just explain sort of the basics in the sense of what is needed to know in order to follow these uh, notebooks um, and understand the learning resources. So the first one that I will be starting with is this empty da training data preparation at the basic level, the one that you can open with this link as well. Um, but it's probably easiest just to sort of to watch for now, um, especially if you only have one screen. I have opened a uh, copy of that so that I can click through this notebook. So this is the first one, and um, this is how our notebooks look like. Um, they have text, as we've explained before, and then they have these code cells that we will be clicking through, and then some more text and some more code cells. So um, everything should be sort of self-explanatory within the notebook itself. And we have also always linked um, the accompanying tutorial videos. So especially if these notebooks are not very clear straight away just from um, reading and clicking through these notebooks. I really recommend having a look at these tutorial videos that we have in our YouTube channel um, because we've really tried to guide the process of going through these notebooks for all of our resources, for all of our topics, um, because it can be really helpful maybe just to hear a voice or to have someone explain it in a bit more detail in comparison to what you can actually see in the notebook. So. Um, I really hope that these uh, can be uh, can be helpful, these videos. Um, and if you open this link, so from the website, if you open the notebook links, you will always be creating a copy of that version um, in your own computer. So you will be able to work within that copy um, and then save that also to your to your drive. Um, so you would and for example if you have changed something you can always go back to our original link and then open it again um and you can start from from scratch sort of um so the the one that you will be opening and working in will always be a copied version all right so i'll just dive right in and and honestly just uh interrupt me if you have a question um so as we've covered before when we talked about the theoretical part um Gathering uh, uh, gathering data for machine translation um, for training the systems is um, sort of a, a specific task already, and it's a very important task because naturally we need uh, good corpus data to train our models, um, and then we need to have a look at our data and um, kind of adjust it in a certain manner in order to then train our systems. And um, Danielle, for example, also mentioned that in in her uh, talk on difficult infer machine translation, because if we just use some, let's say, random data or even already corpus data and upload it, the machine might have an issue with it, or there might be aspects 
that are sort of noise. So the data might be noisy and we need to um, clean it and filter it before we can actually use it to um, train our own system. And there are a number of uh, resources where you can find data to train uh, NMT systems. One of them is Opus, which we have linked here as well, which you can see. And just to show you quickly, um, Opus has a lot of parallel corpus that you can find for a range of different languages. And also in our um, resources, we're often or mostly working with English German, just because those are our languages and you know we needed one to have as an example. But you can use our resources and then um, work work with those resources, but with your own data. So with your own languages, if you're working, you know, with Spanish or with French, um, you can do that as well. And on this uh, page, for example, you can download data. So I would just quickly show you, for example, if I look for English um, as one language and I look for German as another language, then just by typing the languages here, I will get a huge list of um, available corpus, corpora, and um, you can work with any of these that you wanted to, but uh, this is kind of where your data strategy and your data planning comes into play because you have to think about, okay, what type of data do I need? Naturally, we're working with parallel corpora, so um, in this case, English-German data, so it's bilingual, but then you also have to ask yourself the question, um, how much do I, do, data do I need? How long should this data be? Um, would it be in a formal language or informal language? Um, what's the domain? Do I maybe want to work with medical data? Do I want to work with just in general, like web crawl data? So, you know, this is where your data strategy, data planning comes into play. Once you've decided that, you can look here. And these are sort of the lists of the, the names of the data sets. And then here you can always see how many sentences these data sets have. So you can see um, they tend to be rather big. So in the millions and the lower you go, they become smaller. Um, and there are different formats that you can download here. And on the right hand side, you can always look at a sample of how this data looks like um, before maybe deciding which one to download. Um, so the data that we're using on our uh, data preparation notebook is the TED 2020 data from TED Talks. So it's kind of um, normal spoken language. And if we click on sample, for example, we can see, is there a question? No, okay. Um, we can see sort of how this data looks like. So we can see example sentences of um, the type of sentences that is included in the data. And then the one that, the link that we need for our notebook which you don't need to copy because we already have one in our notebook. But if you're looking to get your own data for your own language pair or for a different corpus, um, you can go to the TED 2020 and then we need the Moses format. And if you right click on it, you can copy the address of that link. If you click on it directly, it will download it locally to your computer, but you can copy the link. Um, and this is the link that we have here in our notebook as well. Um, and within this notebook, we can just uh, download it straight away just by referring to this link. And this link is the one that you get by right clicking on Moses, as I've just shown. Um, so before I start clicking through this notebook, I just want to say as well that um, you can change the runtime of your notebook. So um, maybe this is very obvious because many of you have worked with this before. Some of you maybe have not. Um, this is in German, but in English it would say runtime. Maybe you have a completely different language. And um, you can click on changing runtime. And you can see here already I have one GPU selected. You can also work with none. Um, but having one GPU is, in this notebook, it's helpful because it speeds up the coding. And in the NMT training notebook, it's even necessary because our code needs to train on one GPU in order to work. It won't work if you are not using a GPU. Um, so just FYI that we're now training on one GPU. And then I can simply click this cell right here and it automatically downloads um, the data from Opus as, as we've selected. And you can see here, it's the TED 2020 data uh, in the Moses format. 
and we're downloading the German English file. In this case, it's a zip file. And what we're also asking the cell to do is to directly unzip the data. So now here we have the TED 2020 German English German side of the data and the English one. And just to show you on this left hand side here, we can see that now we are working sort of locally within this notebook. So we have not yet connected our notebook to, to Google Drive, for example. So at this very moment, all of the steps and all of this data that we're working with is within this notebook setting. So if I would now close this window, um, that data would be gone which is why at the end of this notebook, we're saving the data that we've worked with and that we've produced to our Google Drive so that we can reuse it later on. But just for now, it is saved locally in this notebook. And you can see that always on the left-hand side when you're looking at the files. So that is, um, that is how we have the data within this notebook. And these are the, the two files that from now on we'll be working with. The thing now with these, um, files is that they might be noisy. So there might be parts within these this corpus that um, sort of is noisy for the machine translation system. Um, so we want to sort of clean the data a little bit. Um, there's more textual information that if you look at this notebook, you can read up on that. I won't sort of go into detail, um, but we need to install some library requirements as well that we'll be working with in this notebook. Um, this is nothing sort of where we need to focus on or that we need to really understand. It's just something that the that we need to load in order to then be able to load code later on. So I'll just let that load. Um, some of these cells take a little longer to load. Others will be a little quicker. You'll find that out. And this information, you can leave that right here or you can also just by clicking on this little cross, just take it away. It's still loaded. You can see here there's a green tick. Um, but then we don't have it visually because that's aspect that we don't need. Um, we have um, prepared some code that we refer to um, that we've saved in our GitHub. So as we've already mentioned, we also have a GitHub repository, which I can show you here. Um, and within our folder learning resources, we have some code and some data that we refer to so that we don't crowd this notebook too much. So what we can do here is we can clone our GitHub and then we can directly refer to the code that we have saved separately in our GitHub. Um, so the next step that we do is we define um, English, this English data set to be our source file, um, the German data set to be our target file. So we would then go from English into German later on. Um, and we also define the language. Um, here you need the language codes so these are also things, obviously, if you want to use these notebooks for different data or for different languages, you would need to rename them accordingly um, because these are then the data that we can also work with later on. Um, so what we do in this step, I'll just click already, is that we clean the data. So like I said, we have this um, rather big data set. This is still... Um, humane, the, we start with around 300,000 sentences. Um, so the big corpora are into the millions of sentences or even more, um, but there still might be noisy data. And with noisy data, it, um, we're talking about the fact that there might be HTML, um, there might be rows with sentences that are too long, as Daniel already mentioned. Um, there might be sentences that are doubled, um, which we would then delete one of those. There might be um, sort of rows that have empty empty cells. Um, so all of this sort of noise is something that we can delete just by um, using this piece of coding here. And we can always see, okay, what is being deleted? And at the end also how many sentences we have left. Um, and it will automatically save this data set, but with the appendix filtered at the end of it. And these will also always be shown on the side here. So we're still working locally in this notebook. Um, and we can, without having to download the data here and having a look at how it looks, we can, uh, for example, have a look at the first two lines of each of these data sets, um, just to double check that they are also perfectly aligned and with aligned, meaning that each 
each sentence is really the translation or the respective other language of that sentence. Um, and we can see, for example, here, the second line in two words, we cook. And then here in German being mit zwei Worten, wir kochen, you can see, okay, it's true, it's aligned. Um, and you can just see examples um, of how this data set looks. So checking data sets in between steps when working with data is really helpful um, just to make sure that everything is really kind of still as it should be. Okay, so now we have, uh, you know, we have decided on a data set, we have collected it, we have downloaded it into this notebook, we have filtered it in the sense that we've cleaned out noisy data. What we now want to do is we want to tokenize this data. Um, and we've talked about, I think this before as well, that, um, you know, as humans, we read natural language and we read the text as it is. We can understand what is going on by reading this, but naturally computers don't do that. They read strings of characters. Um, and in that case, we need to help them understand, sort of process this natural language data. Um, and one way of doing this is called tokenization um, or subwording. There are different um, ways to subword or to tokenize, um, but in general, what is happening uh, to different, uh, uh, in, in a, it's, the, it's done in a different way, depending on which sort of, um, which way you're deciding for, but they are splitting up um, particularly sentences in general, but words into smaller units or into subwords. Um, and then the computer can train on these smaller subwords because this, um, this decreases the vocabulary that the computer um, trains on, but it would also help that, for example, if you get a new word, for example, in German, where we add a lot, a lot of nouns together, um, it, the computer might never have seen this new big word but if it's split up into all these different subwords, then the computer, based on the knowledge on the little subwords it's been trained on, can understand and maybe then translate this new bigger word that previously it had never seen before. So subwording is a very important, um, tokenizing subwording is a very important process that needs to be done in order to train um, machine translation systems. So this is what we can do here. And here we come to the point where some uh, some of the codes are sometimes a little up, outdated or updated. Um, and in this case, there has been an update. So I would just skip this section for now and locally upload subword models because we would we would have trained um, two subword models now. It's important to know that we are training one for the source and one for the target data because naturally we're working with different languages. So um, we have trained one subwording model for our um, source data and for English and one for German for target data. And for that, we apply here sentence piece. Um, and now that we have the source model and the target model, we can access that. And by running this cell, we can tell, um, tell the computer to train our data, which is still a natural language, um, as we have seen up here, this is still natural language, um, which is good for us, but not good for the computer. So now we're actually subwording um, our data. And we can see here at the end, it also says done subwording um, the source and the target file. Once again, um, always good practice checking the data sets. And we can see this data set, uh, has now been subworded. And if you can see in this case, um, there's always an underscore, um, for example, before the word and also um, where there's apostrophes or um, punctuation marks, they are split up. Um, and this is a characteristic of sentence P's. So different subwording tokenization um, processes split these words differently. This is a uh, characteristic for sentence P's. But we can see, okay, this has been subworded now. So this is really nice because we can now work with this subworded data to train um, our machine translation model. And then later on, we will de-subword this data, um, our final translation, so that we can read it or um, post-edit it or send it to the clients. Um, so we're almost done. There's one more thing we need to do um, before we can go to train our data, um, because this is um, not just for machine translation systems, but in general, 
for machine learning systems, we are working with, um, okay, we start with one big data set, but we need to split this data set. So it's always very important that we have one training data set, then we need a development data set or also called a validation data set, and then we need a test data set. And it is really important that all these three data sets um, originate from the one main data set. So I cannot use three different data sets. Um, it has to be the same one, okay? And um, the training data set is always the biggest one. So the training data set should be around 70 to 80% of the entire data set. And then the development and the test data set should be of equal size. They should be between 10 and 20% of the original data set. So splitting your data into these three sub data sets is very critical um, because the machine um, will train on the training data set and then it will use the development data set to validate its training. And then at the end, um, the test data set is what we use to translate and to test how well this machine has been trained. And that is something that we will look at in the um, training notebook. Um, so here, this is based on how big your data is. So I, as I've said, the data that we're working with here is around 300,000 lines. Um, so I have decided here, um, the development and test data set to be of 35,000 lines each which I don't remember exactly, but it's between 10 and 15%. Um, so they will be split equally into this size and the rest will go to the training data set. So just by running this one cell also, we will be able to split this one main data set into these little data sets. And once again, this will be done for both languages. So as you can see down here, now we have six files. Um, we have the English, data set that we can use for training. We have the German data set that we can use for training, um, then the English and the German data set that we can use for uh, validation. And then we have the English and German test data set. And this is already now fully processed, the data. So this is the data that we can actually um, use to train our NMT model. The problem now is, okay, great, we've split this data, we have it here. You know, we have it locally in this notebook, um, but how can we now access this data in the other notebook to then train our model? And um, what you could do, or in general, what you can always do is you can download the data locally here. So by clicking on the three buttons here on the right, um, then you can download the data and then you would locally download it to your computer. But what we can also do is we can connect this notebook to our Google Drive account, um, and then it would automatic it can automatically save this data to a Google Drive account. Um, and one also important thing or interesting thing that we can do is we can check um, the length of our data sets just really quickly, just to make sure that they really are of the same length, and we can see that they are because. Um, the train data set for both languages needs to be of exact same length. So if you're working with millions of sentences, it needs to be to the sentence, it needs to be the exact same number because if there's one sort of mishap, if there's one sentence different difference, um, then it already wouldn't work because the computer really compares each sentence which e with each um, sentence. So it's always very important to check or to make sure that the data set um, are really of the same length. Um, and that's quite practical. Just by testing it here, we can see that the, da the English data is the same length as the German data. But let's go back to saving our data sets. Um, in order to do that, we can connect this notebook to a Google Drive. Um, and for that, we can run this cell here. And then it will ask if it can connect, if we allow the connect uh, to connect it to a Google Drive. So you obviously have to say that you allow it, then you click on your Gmail account. So for this, you need a Gmail account in case you do not have one. Um, and then you scroll down and you can click allow. And then you should get a message saying mounted at Google Drive or something similar. And this takes just a short moment, but now we know, okay, um, we're connected to Drive. 
So what we can do now, um, you can either just run the cell and it would copy all the data that we have here um, into your general Google Drive. So your My Drive is kind of the main thing that you have. So I will show you My Drive, which is rather messy. So, <laughs> um, but this My Drive, which might be different, you know, if you have a different language, um, but this is always kind of your main location. Um, so what you could do is you could just run the cell and copy the data straight away into your My Drive. But I already have so much data right here. That would just be messy. So what we can do is we can create a folder ourselves. OK, so now this is like more hands on. We start doing something. Um, and just as an example that I gave is we can call um, a folder empty data preparation. So I'll just copy this just to make sure it's spelled exactly the same. So, you know, capitalization. Um, underscore, um, everything has to be exactly the same. So I will create a new folder. I will copy that into here, paste it into here. And then right here now, I have a folder, empty data preparation. And then I can run the cell. And I might, might take a moment because I've just created it. And maybe I need to connect to drive again. Because I had this um, will take always a few, not minutes, seconds until all the data has been copied into the folder, depending also on how much data it is, how big the data is. But there you can see by just running that one cell, um, we can copy all the data into this folder. So now all the data that we've used and created throughout this process on this left hand side here has now been copied into my Google Drive. So they're saved there. And you could also by clicking this button here, you can also check um, the contents of your Google Drive folder. But obviously, it's also nice to actually look into your drive <laughs> and make sure it's there. So this is already the first notebook done. So now we have collected our data, we have prepared it, we have saved it. And now we can move on to our NMT training notebook. And this one is also saved here on our website, training an NMT model. Um, so in this link here, that's how you can access this notebook. And once again, if you open this one, it will autom automatically um, open a copy of it in on your computer, which I have already done. So um, this is the fun, funnest notebook uh, for me personally, because now we actually train our own NMT system. And this depends on the data that you have chosen to prepare. So now we're working with the TED 2020 data. Um, but maybe you know, you're working with your own languages, you're working with your own data sets. Um, but this is really sort of where we put this to test and where we actually train our own model. Um, as sort of mentioned quickly at the end before, um, this is based on the Open NMT Pi toolkit, um, which is really great. So there's definite um, there's different toolkits that are available to work with. So um, as mentioned before already, like Mute NMT is um, based on Joey NMT. And in general, there's different ways of training your own NMT system. Um, Open NMT Pi is quite helpful because as is Joey NMT, um, because they do most of the work for you in the sense that they do all the coding and they do all the model preparation. And then we can refer to those models and um, use those codes and simply by applying our data, we can use their models. Obviously, depending on how you've prepared your data or by editing their models as well, you can sort of fine tune the models, change the models. Um, but that is really something that's sort of next next step, next level. Um, so what we're using um, is their toolkit. And I will talk through a few sort of rather important aspects. Um, 
on sort of that are just important to or interesting to know um, when doing so. Um, also, as a side note, we will now be using the data that we've literally just created. But in case that hasn't been possible for you, um, you can also access the data here in our GitHub repository um, where you can download it and then upload it to Google Drive um, and then train this notebook yourself. This is all also explained um, in our tutorial video, um, how to do that, that step. Okay, so for the notebook we've used before, it was optional whether we wanted to use a GPU. We could have also um, used just a CPU. Um, but for this one, we actively need to use GPU. So I'm just making sure that we have that. I can save that. I might get a warning now because I have the other notebook open with a GPU and I can only use one notebook at a time with a GPU. I have the Color Pro version, so I can work on different notebooks, but only on CPU, which is sort of the slower version. Um, but you can only ever use, have one notebook open uh, using GPU. So, Maybe it switches automatically to this one now. That's great. So what we need to do first is we need to install um, OpenNMTPy package, which we can do by running this cell here. And of, as before, we've linked uh, relevant information here. So if you ever want to know more about OpenNMTPy or about the forum or things that are discussed, um, you can just click through the links here. And also this notebook is something um, that will take a little longer if you really do click through everything and if you really do load um, your own model. We are working with, um, as I mentioned, a rather small data set, so not even 300,000 um, sentences, um, which is why we can sort of get by training this a little, our own little NMT system for around one hour. So if I click uh, on the training process um, to fully train, it would take around one hour, um, which is really, really short in comparison to what these models are being trained on. Um, and this is only okay because we have a small data set and because you know we're not expecting the best translation in the end. We just want to see something that works um, and that actually translates. Um, but Bigger models, you know, if you're working millions of sentences, they train at least for around half a day, a day. Um, and the really bigger models, you know, trained by DeepL and other systems, they really train for multiple days. Um, so that is also something to really be aware of that. Sort of we have a we have a mini version here um, just to show how it works. Um, but if you do want to um, train bigger models, you need to increase the steps, the training time. Okay, so I have installed the OpenNMTPy package. You can see that because of the green tick. Um, I once again connect this notebook to my Google Drive. I have to um, allow that again. This is something that you always have to do every time you open a notebook. You, um, you have to connect it to Google Drive um, every time over again. <clears throat> All right, so we can see it's mounted at uh, Drive. Um, and this is where we are now referring to the exact data sets that we've just created. Um, so these six data sets are the ones that we now need. Um, and this is where you actively need to change um, you, and need to edit your folder name. So we have created this folder, right? The empty data preparation one. So this command says that we will now change directory straight away to that Google Drive folder. So before we were always working locally in our Colab notebook, right? We were working like on the side here and you could see the data on the side here. Now we won't be doing that because it's like way too much information, way too much content to be saving in this Google, uh, in this notebook. Um, and also, you know, in case it crashes, all your data would be lost if you're working here locally. 
um, which is okay for the data preparation notebook because you can click through it within a few minutes. Um, and in case it crashes, you just do it again, it goes really fast. But this is something that loads for much longer and there's much more information here that we save it straight away um, to our Google Drive. Um, so what we've done here now is we have changed the directory to that folder. And we are also just giving the command to list us everything that we have in that folder. And just to make sure um, it does show us um, all the things, all the data that we've just saved into the Google, um, Google Drive folder. <clears throat> so this is sort of the, I would say the most interesting aspect. Um, and ironically, this one big code cell loads within a millisecond, but it has all the information. Um, so I find this one really, really interesting to sort of talk about it in a bit more detail because also you will find this and you will find this information um, if you are uh, planning to train your own your own NMT system online. Um, and you will see this here, but maybe if you don't know what this means, this you know doesn't really say much. Um, when I started training an NMT system for the first time, I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, by reading this, I was like, oh, okay, I just have to run the cell and you know somehow it will work. But I didn't really understand any of um, what it actually meant. So I thought it would be really helpful um, to talk in a bit more detail what this configuration file actually does. Um, and especially because these are some aspects that you might need to change later on if you're working with different data or if you're working with uh, larger data and you want to train for longer, these are things that you actively need to change. Um, I've explained um, these steps here, these parameters here. So you can also read up on that later on. And I've also explained them in the tutorial video, um, but I will cover a few of these, um, a few of these points here. So this little cell here, if you run it, it creates a config file. And as you can see, that was not even one second and it's already done um, because it just saves all this information. Um, but what it does here, it saves this configuration file straight away into the folder that we're now working with. So you can see now in my Google Drive, I've created this config file. And this just contains all the information literally just written as we have looked at it. So this is the same as this, okay? So this is what we've done. We've saved this information. But what this config file says is as we run, as we train the NMT system, we're creating a new folder run. For example, this is what it does here. And with it, within that folder run here, we refer to this folder. We will then create our source vocab and our target vocab. So in the next step, based on our training data or input data, we will actually create vocabulary files. And these vocabulary files will be saved in this run folder. Then what we do here is we access our training data. And this would be important if you ever train, uh, if you ever use different training data, then you would need to change the names here. Right, so this is, I'm referring to the name of the data that we have just created. But if you create um, a different data set and have a different name that is not from TED Talks or whatever, um, you need to change that name actively here. So here we're referring to our source data. So the source training data then the target training data. And here we're referring to our validation data sets. So the development data set for English and for German. So this is what is happening right here. Then here, as I already mentioned, that's where we will be saving source and target vocabulary files. This refers to how big these files are supposed to be. So here we're saying that the vocab file uh, should be of 50,000 words or 50,000 sort of vocabulary sections. Um, here, for example, we are referring to um, we're calling on our tokenization uh, models, the source and the target models, um, which will be processed later on that we've already created, right? We already have those in our folder, the source model and the target model. 
So that's what we're calling here. Um, this is also really important, this log file. Um, so as we train the NMT system, all the information uh, gets saved in this train.log file. And this train.log file will also be saved at the end of the training in our notebook here, in our Google Drive folder here. Um, and that contains very important information on how the accuracy changes throughout the training, how many steps we have trained the system, and all that information will be contained in this train.log file. And then this is, I guess, the most important because this is where actual models will be saved. So we will, this automatically creates a folder called models, which will also be saved in our Google Drive. And for each step, we decide how many, it will save a model in this folder. And this model, the last model, sort of the best model at the end of the training, is the one that we then use to translate our test data set. So saving the models um, obviously is then the most important because this is the one that we refer to in the end to actually translate. Um, then I just, I'll skip to a few, but for example, this also says that we um, save a model every 1000 steps, all right? So this is also rather small but um, we will only train for around one hour. So we will save in total four uh, model steps. So we decide this. Um, we say, okay, in total, we want to save four models and we want to save one every thousand steps. So at the end of the training, we will have 4,000 um, training steps and every thousand steps we have saved one model. So we have four models in the end. This is because our data is rather small, our data sets. If you have much larger data sets and you want to train for 10 hours or for a day, um, you would not save a checkpoint every thousand steps because that's way too frequent. Then you might save one every 5,000 steps or even every 10,000 steps. Okay. So this really, this is something that really varies depending on um, how long you want to train your data, how big your data is. Um, but for sort of a little, a little uh, example here, we can just save it um, four times every thousand steps. And that means in the end, it's around one hour that it loads. Um, and this you can see here that we train the 4,000 steps. We define this here and you can see here, this easily goes up to, this can easily go up to uh, 100,000 steps or even more if you're training for longer times. Um, almost uh, sort of the last parameters that are, very relevant. Um, this is the validation steps. So this shows that every 1,000 steps, we will validate our training. So this is where the development data set comes into play, that every 1,000 steps, we use the development data to validate how our um, system is being trained. So this also in total then occurs four times. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to mention is because there's more information here. A lot of this now talks about the fact that we're using, for example, the transformer architecture. So this is the state of the art architecture that we've mentioned before. Um, I think that we're using the transformer architecture. And then this aspect here I wanted to show, for example, is that we're using a learning rate of one, which is quite high. So um, we're using a learning rate of one for this example because we wanted to train quite quickly because we're only training it for one hour. Um, if you are training your data for uh, 10 hours or days, uh, a learning rate of one is way too high. You would need to have a learning rate, and it frequently is, as it's commented here, like 0 0.02 or 0 0.002 even. Um, because if you're working with uh, larger data sets, and longer training times, you want it to learn slower. You don't want it to learn um, too quick because then it would at one point stop learning. Um, and then, um, yeah, it would overfit and there's no information, it would be bad. So for this example, a learning rate of one um, is fine, it's helpful, but for bigger training data sets, this definitely needs to be changed to a lower learning rate. Okay, so we have, 
created this config file already. We've seen uh, we've seen it in our notebook here, and I'm aware I only have a few more minutes left. Um, what we would then do next is we build our vocabulary files. So as we've specified above, we have we will have vocabulary files of around fifty thousand words, and you see that here. So we, want, we have one for the source and one for the target. And once again, we can check our vocabulary files. Um, and this just shows us a few examples of sort of the most common vocabs that we have, like the der, die, das kind of thing, and the least uh, typical ones like eucalypt from eucalyptus or something. Um, so this is how you can see how the vocabulary is saved in the folder. And we will see automatically by running the cell, we will have created this run folder here. And within that run folder, we now have the source vocabulary and the target vocabulary. So this happened automatically from what we've defined in our config file. All right, so now that we have all of this, we can actually already start training. So this notebook is actually quite easy to run through. Um, there's not a lot of code that we need to process thanks to OpenNMT. Um, so what we can do now is we can actually start training the model. Um, and now we wait for an hour. <laughs> no, but um, this really does now need around one hour to train. Um, so obviously we won't be able to finish this now at this point in this session. Um, but what is important uh, to know when you're training an NMT model is that the computer needs to stay on. So if the computer goes into, uh, how do you call it? If it's like into energy saving mode, this, um, or if it turns off, uh, your model will most likely stop loading. So it is very important to um, always keep your computer on. For one hour, that might sound like it's not a problem, but if you're training a system for 10 hours or even overnight, you need to keep your computer on. So what I did is that I plug it in um, and then I change my computer settings that it doesn't go into standby mode um, and it doesn't shut down whenever it's plugged in. So I can plug my computer in and leave it on and leave it training for uh, two days if I wanted to. Um, if you might have a connection issue, considering we're doing this online and we're using you know, what Google is giving us, if you ever have a connection issue, that could also disrupt um, your training process. Um, if you're training for longer, but usually that's fine for a few hours and it should definitely be fine for one hour. But those are two sort of important factors to be aware of that if I walk away now and the computer goes into uh, powers off, it would stop training and then, you know, it's all lost and you would have to start again. Um, so that's uh, just something important um, to be aware of. And just to finish off, um, it's also quite interesting because there's a lot of information here that we can see, which is not relevant for us to know or for us to understand specifically. But we can see here that we're using the transformer because it's referring to the transformer encoder um, and you know to the multi-head attention and to all the layers and the softmax distribution and all those things. So without explaining and going into detail, um, you can see that it's all there and that it is using a training on the transformer architecture. But this information at, at the top is kind of irrelevant specifically for our training. What is important to look at um, is are the training steps that we see down here. So we see, as I'd mentioned before, we have a total of 4,000 training steps. And now we can just see um, that was the first one. Um, so we will see one every 100 steps, we will see a training step. And you can see this here, this is the accuracy. So right now our accuracy is at seven, which naturally is very, very low. It goes up to a hundred. Um, and as this training goes on, we will see this accuracy increase. So this is something that we want to see, the accuracy should increase. And this, what we see here is the cross entropy. That is something that we want to see decrease. So now it's still at 9.5. We want this to go as low as possible, as low, as close to zero as possible. Um, within our sort of this uh, data in this scenario, I think we can reach an accuracy of about 70% and across entropy, maybe around two. Um, so just kind of to know that obviously then the higher you get and the lower you get, um, 
your your system will also train better. But you can already see from the first step to the second step, the accuracy has increased to almost 12 and the cross entropy has dropped. So in the beginning, these differences will be quite noticeable and quite high. And in the steps later on, um, this will sort of, the accuracy will increase much slower. And sometimes maybe it won't increase for a few steps and then it increases again. And then maybe only by like 0 0.1 or something. So in the beginning, um, it learns quicker. And then as you go on, it learns a bit slower. So these are interesting um, things. And this is what is then saved in the log file. Um, all of this information that I've talked about will be saved in the log file in the end. And just because we don't have time to um, sort of wait until this model has finished training, I can show you of what I did yesterday is how it looks when we then translate the data. So once I then train the model, I refer to, you remember I said it saves it in a folder called models, and then it would be the last one, the one saved at step 4,000. And this is the one I then call to translate um, the test data. And this is what it would look like. So this would be our output sentence um, in English, subworded still, right? And this would be our, um, our input sentence in English and then our output German translation. Um, and this is still uh, subworded. We would then desubword this. Um, and this is just an example. Then in the end, we can see, okay, this information would then be desubworded again. But these are steps that now we don't have time to click through since this will train for a while now. But I hope that I could explain a little bit um, the process of you know what is necessary to find data, to clean the data, prepare the data, support it, divide it into different data sets, um, how to save it, how to upload it, how to refer to it, what you need to know to train uh, your own model, kind of what the important parameters are. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully you can do it yourself also with different data um, and try it out yourself. So this is kind of what we've attempted to do with this learning resource to kind of, um, it's based obviously on existing code that we've adapted to our own needs, to our own data, but hopefully explained in a lot of detail um, so that you can all sort of try it out yourself. And this is also what I've really explained in the YouTube videos. Um, so in case you um, have more questions, I hope that they can be a good resource. Yeah. Thank you very much, Janisa. Um, it's very interesting to see to have a look behind all those um, all this process, the MT training process, and the, the learning resources. Um, I still have a question here in the chat from Alina. Um, does early stopping find the best model based on accuracy, accuracy, and perplexity scores? So it does not rely on quality evaluation metrics such as Bleu um, no. to choose when to stop training, right? No, um, it doesn't It doesn't have anything to do with Bleu or anything. As far as I'm concerned, that is not incorporated in here. In this case, I, I guess you're referring to this. Um, this is to prevent overfitting when training the model. Um, so this would refer to maybe what we see here with the, with the aspects of accuracy or cross entropy that we don't, in, in our case, we have the early stopping as well, but we don't actually need actually need it because we don't train for it long enough. Um, but this means that if there um, have been like N validations, so validations is what we do every 1000 steps. So this says that if we have, uh, in this case, we define N to be 10. So this says if we have 10 validations um, and it's it hasn't improved, uh, the training hasn't improved, then please stop the training because clearly it's not improving anymore. Um, since we're only validating this um, four times, and this is a very short example, this is irrelevant um, for us in this aspect, but um, especially for training larger models, this is relevant um, that it doesn't, uh, that the, um, yeah, that the models don't overfit and then it would naturally stop, but it's not based on, on Bleu. Could I add something to this? Please. 
If I'm not mistaken, I think the blue or TR, the, the empty quality measures, they come into play once model training has stopped and then you translate the test data set in order to see how well your model performed or the, the final model, the best model from the, the training phase performs. Then you translate the test data set and then you usually have empty quality evaluation scores like TR or blue and report these for the translation of the test data set. Yeah, actually, yeah. So this is also what is included here at the end of this notebook, which you could do where you quickly uh, calculate a blur for uh, this. I think this, if I if I run through this, this gets me a blur of like 20 something, which is okay, considering we only train for one hour. Um, but yeah, that's where blur comes into play. Thank you very much, Janisa and Professor Krüger. Um, I have a look at the time now. We are um, one minute over the time. Um, I would suggest that we will change to the next practical session. Professor Krüger, who leads the whole Data Lit MT project, uh, will hold this session together with André Busch um, and also Janisa Hackenbuchner again. And the topic is MT-specific data evaluation, analyzing machine translation needs in post edits and calculating string matching-based and embedding-based metrics for automatic MT quality evaluation using Python-based Jupyter notebooks. Very long title, um, Professor Krüger, the floor is yours. Thanks. It's basically uh, two subtopics. We put them together in one session. Andre, uh, do you want to start with uh, machine translation ease? Yeah, I can go ahead. Okay. Good. All right, let me just share the notebook. Mm -hmm. So can you see the notebook? I hope so. Yes. Perfect. Yes, we do. Perfect. So um, as in Janice's presentation, feel free to ask any questions in the chat or unmute yourself, then uh, I will help you to uh, discuss them with you. So this notebook uh, forms part of our learning resource for data evaluation. So we are going to analyze, visualize and interpret data in a machine translation context, obviously. But to be clear, this, is well, this was a mix of different dimensions and competencies of data at MT, since we also have to prepare some data for our analysis to be successful. Specifically, in this notebook, we will compare various target texts produced in different translation scenarios, namely machine translation, machine translation post-editing, and human translation from scratch, to see how these different target texts differ. In doing so, we want um, the students or people to complete this notebook to become aware of the linguistic tendencies and features that may compromise final translation quality especially in unedited machine translation output and post-edited output. And as always, these notebooks start with some introductory information. And in this part here, we talk about deceptive fluency of NMT output. Deceptive fluency basically means that the output reads very well, but may actually contain errors such as critical shifts in content and or inappropriate or unfamiliar terms or expressions that our target audiences might not know or be unfamiliar with. So after completing this learning resources, our students should feel competent enough to critically analyze NMT output and not simply adopt uh, the suggestions of an NMT system just because they sound nice. So after establishing this context above, we try to introduce the students to some basic concepts that they are going to need when analyzing the text we provide, namely translation needs, machine translation needs, and post edits. Human translation have been found to exhibit linguistic features that differentiate them from their source texts on the one hand, but also from the texts that would have been originally produced in the target language. And here we list four, simplification, normalization, explicitation, and interference. But in this notebook, we are only going to focus uh, on simplification and sometimes on interference, but again, mostly on simplification. And simplification means that human translations are assumed to be lexically, syntactically, or stylistically simpler than their source text. 
And interestingly, these or well, this tendency of simplification and interference can also be um, can also be seen in MT output, which then again distinguishes it from source texts and from human from scratch translations and from original target texts. And this can be described in regarding translation needs as machine translation needs, as for example for Massen Novet Aldu in their publication in 2021. And these authors found a decreased lexical richness, or how we call it in this notebook variety, in NMT output compared to corresponding source texts. And they call this phenomenon artificially impoverished language. And we will also have a look at exactly that because we will look at the vocabulary in both NMT uh, output and then again in post edit output and compare that to the to, to how diverse the vocabulary is in human translations that have been produced from scratch from source text. And regarding post editing or post edit outputs, Tuval, for example, found that these patterns, for example, simplification, can also be present in post edited output, which he describes as post edits. And then again, we also will. Um, we also want to find out if these patterns can be found in our target text that we are going to analyze here in the notebook. Now, that's why we included this whole section around here. And then we go on by including priming. Priming effects have been identified in both human translation and in post edit output, and also in human translations from the source text in this kind. But it is interesting that priming can also occur or even to a stronger degree in post editing than in human translation because the post edited output is already obviously produced in the target language. And there's, therefore, it might be harder for post editors to come up with alternative solutions for their post editing text or for their final translation result. And I won't have time to go into much detail here, but if you want to learn more about these concepts, you can find here on this link, our companion paper for the basic level that goes into much more detail regarding these concepts. And of course, you're always welcome as in Janice's presentation to go to the accompanying tutorial video for this notebook, where I can uh, dive into this a little bit as well. Now, putting theory into practice, as I said, we're going to look at different translation scenarios and the text produced in these scenarios. And namely, we are going to look at these here. So one raw or unedited NMT output, which has been produced by DeepL, and then five fully post-edited versions of this output, or MTPE for short, and five human translations from scratch, which have been produced by professional translators or translation students um, directly from the English source text. And all the target texts are in German. And since it is our analysis and we want to do um, or perform an analysis right here and also interpret our results, we start with a hypothesis that we want to either confirm or deny. So in this notebook, we want to have a look at the hypothesis this is called the following. Both lexical density and variety will be lowest in raw or an uh, edited NMT output, higher in post-edited output, and highest in human translation. And we show we will have a look at that if that is the case for our target texts. Right. So then we finally arrive at the practical part of the notebook. And you can also navigate through the chapters of this practical part by going here in the table of contents. And then you can see that we start here with section zero and go down to access the target text files. And in section two, we talk about the lexical variety. And in section three, we are going to look at lexical density. These two concepts uh, are really important for this notebook, lexical variety and density. I already explained lexical variety a little bit, but I will go into these concepts um, when we start at these at the respective sections. 
So section zero is mostly housekeeping. It will be quick, I promise. It's just to make sure that you meet the requirements in your environment to use this notebook and to assess our files. So the first thing we need to do is we need to clone our repository into the environment here, which is pretty quick. And we can, and we can see if that is successful by looking at the green check mark right here, but we can also confirm this in the files at the sidebar. And we can see that here is a folder datalmt and this has been cloned the learning resource, perfect. And now we just have to change the directory in order to assess the folder and the documents in this folder. So we don't want this cell. And then you can see that we have our target text here. We got the NMT output right here and then the different post edited versions, which are oh, this one, for example, MTPEA1 and our different human translations, HT for human translation and B1025. You can also see these right here under learning resources, machine translation needs, documents, and then we got our different target texts here. Perfect. So in order to assess the text within the files, since these are word files, we need first need to extract the text from these files, which we do by using the library docx2txt. And then we also have to install the library lexical richness, which will help us to calculate the lexical variety. So we just want the cell here. This should only take a few seconds, actually. And generally these, um, especially these cells uh, where we install something, generally produce a lot of output data or protocol data if you want. But uh, since this is not really relevant here, we can just clear that out to save some space. And that's it, you're ready to go. Now in section one, we are going to assess our files, which means that we are actually going to extract the text and save them or save the text of the different texts in variables. For example, we're going to create a variable text NMT to save the text of the NMT output. Text A1 to text A5 will contain the text of our post edited versions of this output and text B6 to text B10 are going to contain the human translations from scratch. So we just are going to import this and then this cell here will create the variables and save all of these variables, so all of our texts in a list. And this grouping in lists will happen a lot in this notebook to facilitate further processing and later visualization of our data analysis results. So let's run this. Perfect. Now that we've got that all set up, we can actually start our analysis with Lexico Variety. As I said, lexical variety describes how lexically diverse the vocabularies of our target texts are. And this is also called lexical diversity or lexical richness, for example. And we do that by calculating the type token ratio. Types are the number of different words forms in a text. So if, for example, the, the article, the, for example, occurs in a text multiple times, but will then be only be counted once. So it is, it is the same word form every time. Tokens, on the other hand, are just the total number of the words in the text. And the type token ratio is then obtained by dividing the number of types by the number of tokens in a text. And this is a really um, good example of how we try to break down the complexity of this topic, since we always start, or at least at some point, start with one only calculating the values for one text and then later doing it for all of them, just to enable our students to get a un better understanding of what is going on. So we just import the model again that we have installed moments ago. And then we want lexical richness to give us the number of tokens in text A1, so the first post edited output, then the number of types, and then we wanted to calculate the type token ratio in text A1. 
And then the cell tells us that the um, text A1 has 301 tokens and 159 types and the ratio of 0 0.53 around about. And of course, it is, it is nice to show the students what is going on behind um, the curtains, if you want, or in, we show it to them in much more detail. But again, we, of course, need these values for all of our text. And this is what this cell down here will achieve. And as you can see, um, all of the tokens and types and type token ratios for all of our text are now here saved in three lists that we can access for later processing and visualization. What is interesting to note is that we obtain different results in the data MT project because we worked on different levels and with different tools. For example, in the basic level learning resource, which is a companion of this notebook, we used the, the corpus analysis software and Kong. And this told us that um, take the NMT output, for example, had a few less types actually, which ever so slightly increases lexical uh, variety. So that's something to keep in mind while performing any data analysis, really. The methods and tools you use actually um, have an effect on your results. But now that we got our results, um, it is great that we have a list, but those are really rather hard to interpret. So we opt in this notebook and in many other notebooks or contents and resources in our project to visualize these um, numbers and lists. And for this one, we use um, the library Lab.lib, which is a really common library for creating visualizations in Python. So if we just are going to import Matplotlib, and then we have a look at just really quickly uh, a look at this rather big code cell. Um, I was told tell everybody to not be intimidated because it will it is really easier than it looks. Um, we are just going to define um, what our table we are going to visualize a table now um, will look like. For example, we want our text title to be included, text NMT, text A1, for example. And here in the list data, we are including all of the values from the lists that we have created earlier. And for example, this, um, this first line then represents the, the NMT output, his text, the number of types and the number of tokens, and also the type token ratio of the NMT output, which we round to three to just make it more visually appealing. And then we are also coloring our table, which is really not necessary, it's completely optional, but it's just to enable the students or the users of this notebook to differentiate easily between the different scenarios. Use red for the MT output, yellow for the post-edit outputs, and green for the human translation. Right, and then we can run the cell. And then we see that we have then created a much more clear representation of our data actually, because I, I myself found it really clear and helpful, much more helpful than just having three lists and having to pick out every um, value myself. But then again, it's just, just a table. So what we can also do with matplotlib and what is even more clear is or our line charts, for example. And that we can do by um, following the instructions down here. First, we can, for example, plot the different numbers of types and tokens from the various texts. Again, um, this is just a lot of code, but basically it will produce two lines, one for the number of types and one for the number of tokens down here. And here we can see that um, it really puts in perspective how the numbers of types and tokens are varying between the different texts. For example, we can see that text B10, which is one of our human translations, has the highest number of types and the highest number of tokens. But we can also see that B7, for example, has a relatively low number of types and also probably or surely the no lowest number of tokens, which is really interesting to see actually. 
And this is already nice, but again, to calculate or to assess the lexical variety of the text, we need to calculate or visualize um, the type token ratios of our text. And this can be done by using the cell down here. Again, this will this line chart again will then only contain a single line mapping the different type token ratio values of our text. So in this in this example, we also include dotted lines just to divide our translation scenarios in three sections. And what is interesting is that our two of our post-edited texts, A1 and A2, have a higher type token ratio, so a higher lexical variety than our post-edited outputs. The texts A3 to A5 score relatively similar. Then our texts, our human translations, B6 to B8 score higher, both in the NNT output and all of our post-edited texts. And B10 is also really high and is just beaten by the post-edited text A2. What was surprising to us when we analyzed this in the advanced level is that B10, which is a human translation, is almost as low or on a similar level than compared to the MT output and three of the post-edited texts, which is really surprising since in our basic level, this, um, this human translation B9 scored much higher. And again, this is an example of how the use of tools can affect your analysis results. And if you are interested in the basic level calculations, which differ in this case from our advanced level calculations, calculations, you can access our basic level here via, via this link. Now, um, for interpretation regarding, we thought it was really interesting to also have a look at that. And you can see the interpretation or just a short interpretation down here in section 2.3. Generally, um, regarding our hypothesis at the end or at the beginning of our notebook, we told you that NMT was supposed to be lowest uh, lexical variety was supposed to be lowest in the NMT output, which is the case in our example. It should be um, a little higher in post-edit outputs, which is the case again in A2 and A1, but not really in A3, A4, and A5. Then again, the human translations go higher, and in average, at least, just the only outlier would be B9 in this case. And we also had an interesting example here, um, if you want to have a look at that, because um, when, the sim when the source text or it is really similar in meaning, for example, the two verbs promote and advertise, then the LMT output tends to uh, reproduce just the same verb because it is just um, more common in the training data, really, to translate verben both for promote and advertise. And then again, you can see that the human translators and the post editors have opted for other uh, more lexical diverse um, options as you will. And now, since we now have assessed the lexical variety of our target text, we can move on to lexical density. Lexical density is a way of measuring how much an information a text contains, if you want to put it um, in a little bit more abstract way. And we try to calculate that by calculating the ratio between the number of content words in a text and the overall number of tokens in a text. But what exactly are content words? That was uh, my question when I started to work on this learning resource. And it is not that clear because, for example, Terrell counts nouns verbs, adjectives, and adverbs as content words. So words that really do um, provide meaning to the text. But we ask ourselves, is that will include all kinds of verbs? For example, what about auxiliary verbs? And what about proper nouns? So we just wanted to make sure that we are go going to count nouns, proper nouns, verbs, but no auxiliary verbs, adverbs, and adjectives as content words. And just ag and again, the um, the note here, if you are counting different con content words that vary from our uh, method here, you will, of course, obtain different results. Now, to actually 
calculate the lexical density, we of course need to know how many content words are in our target texts. And to do this, we need a bit to do a bit of data preparation first. Second. And we do that by tagging our texts, which means that we are going to assign part of speech information to every token in our text. For example, here, website noun. And we do that with Spacey. Spacey is an open source library for advanced natural language processing in Python. And we also need to tell Spacey that we are working with German translation data or target texts. So we also need a German Spacey model or a German language model to assign the part of speech information. And we have, again can import Spacey and install and load the German language model into a variable to use it for further processing. This should just take a few seconds actually. And again, this helps use a lot of protocol data just to make sure that everything works as intended, but we can clear it out yeah, once it has installed or be imported successfully. And now we define the text for POS tagging. Obviously we use the variables from above and create new variables to save them with the NLP function. And then again, we group text for calculation and processing and visualization. And now all of our texts have been tagged successfully, but it's a shame that we do not see um, that much what goes on um, in the background. So again, uh, to break down this level of complexity or to um, enable our students to understand what, what's going on, we added a section for understanding the details. Basically what we are going to do is we're just um, taking again text A1, so one of our posts and the text and show to everybody how this is going to work. So we see that the code prints all tokens vertically and assigns POS tag to them. For example, website noun, verlinked verb, is auxiliary verb, and comma is punctuation, etc. And this is really helpful since we now see how this all works. Just a little more example. And we can see that the number of, or what we now want to do actually is that the number of different tags will then be added together to obtain the content word count because you obviously need to know how many content words are in the text aside from all the function words. So that is what this cell right here will achieve. And again, we are counting nouns, proper nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Right, now we know the number of content words solely in the text A1. And what you might have already noticed in the output of this cell above is that not every of, this, of these automatically assigned POS text is necessarily correct. For example, let me see. These um, yeah, enumer enumerations are partly assigned noun text, etc. And there are many examples, um, in, in fact, about seven, I think, that have been um, incorrectly assigned to our tokens. And to account for this um, yeah, automatic error, we are going to calculate an error rate just to make sure that um, yeah, we do not distort our content word count in the context of our analysis. So uh, we do that by dividing the incorrectly assigned POS text by all of them and assigning or multiplying that by 100 in order to uh, get a percentage that we can then project on our other text since we obviously think that this will occur in the other texts as well. Right, and then we can start by actually counting the content words for all text, not just for the text A1 as we did previously. And this is what this cell will achieve. Right, perfect. Now we have the content word count for all of our target texts. And now we have to extract these numbers from the list in order to enable further processing and thus and 
integers do that by assessing each integer in this or each position, if, if you want, in this list and save them in the respective variable full text for NMT, A1 to A5 and B6 to, or B5, B6 to B10. Right, now that we have prepared um, and all the data and got everything set up, we can actually finally start to calculate the lexical density, which we can do by dividing the number of content words, which we have here in our variables, content words MT, by the number of tokens, uh, which we get from the list from the lexical dense variety section, actually. And then again, we group all of our lexical density values in a list to enable visual visualization later. Great. Now, um, right, what I've always missed is um, the error rate, which we need to account for. And we will also do calculate this in the list to enable visual visualization in error bars later. And we're going also going to save them variables to make it easier to calculate that. Great. So now we have a list of all the density errors, which, which you can use to create error bars in our visualization to account for the incorrectly assigned POS tags. And we're going to visualize the results in a line chart again. Um, again, this the code cell is rather big, but um, it's just basically it's the same as we did previously. First, we are going to visualize um, these all of these results we obtained in lists in a table just to get a bit, bit a, better overview of our data analysis, since it is really a, a lot of lists that we've created. Right, and now you can see all of our target texts, of text text if you want, the content words in each of them, the number of tokens, the lexical density values, and the density errors for each text. Great. Then we go on to plot the graphical representation. And again, for the error bars and just line chart. Right, perfect. And now we can see that the NMT output indeed, as we've told you in the hypothesis in the introduction of the notebook, has lowest lexical density. Then come most of the post editor text. Again, A1 and A2 score relatively high in compared to the NMT output, A3 to A5 again lower. And then we have B6 and B7, which score relatively high. B7 is the highest actually. And then B8, B9 and B10, which score also score relatively high. And B10 again scores a little bit under um, the post edited text A2. So that's basically um, all of the um, calculations and visualizations and processing that we've concluded in this notebook. Um, and it's interesting to see that, we, again, we have some outliers um, from our hypothesis in the introduction, but keep in mind that we only analyzed 11 one-page documents and that the um, picture is much clearer in larger scale anal analyses. For example, um, again, our trusted source here, Chival, is 2000, from 2019, found a much more clear picture. And although he doubted that the degree of lexical density in comparison to lexical variety is a systematic difference between the different translation scenarios. Right. And that also already brings us to the conclusion. And I hope I'm, oh, well, I'm a little bit over time. I don't know if we have time to discuss that. Um, if not, you can, you're can. you always welcome to read this by yourself or, as I said, uh, consult a recording in our video. OK, great. Thanks, Andre. I, I think we'll move to MT quality evaluation now. And if there are mm -hmm. questions, we can take them in, in the wrap-up session. All right. Let me check whether I can share my screen. Um, OK, 
Can you see the notebook? Not yeah, yet. I Can see you see the agenda of um, from Beaten Mat? No, that's not good. When sharing the screen, you can select um, whether you just want to share one screen or the entire screen. Maybe it was that. Yeah, it is indeed different from Zoom now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Yeah, I'll be a bit more brief. I think it will take 20 minutes to go through this uh, notebook. I mean, empty quality version is a fairly well covered topic out there. Also, Leif was, uh, Leif was talking about the Matteo project where they implemented uh, different scores. Again, we have a Jupyter notebook. Um, where we implemented different scores, we make a fundamental fundamental distinction in this notebook between traditional, what we call traditional MT quality scores, which rely on ex exact string matching between a string A, which could be the MT output, which is also called hypothesis or candidate in MT res research, and string B would be a human reference translation, which is our gold standard. And then we always want the MT output to be as close as possible to the gold standard to the human reference translation. If it is close to this reference, we assume it's a good MT quality. If it's far away from this gold standard, we assume it's a bad MT quality, which is not an unproblematic assumption, but this is the basic working principle of, of, of many MT quality relation scores out there. So string matching based metrics on the one hand and embedding based word embedding or word vector based metrics on the other hand, uh, particularly bird score and commit what Leaf was also talking about, which they implemented in the Matteo project. And the string matching based metrics, they can only um, measure formal similarity if two strings are formally similar. And these word vector word embedding based metrics, they can measure semantic similarity. So you may have two strings which are formally very different, but they express basically the same meaning. String matching based metrics will not be able to capture this, these embedding based metrics do. So there's a nice contrast between this old generation, which is blue and translation edit rate, etc., and the new generation, uh, bird score, commit, etc. And also this new, you know, neural machine translation, they work with these word embeddings, with these word vectors. And before this new generation of metrics, you had the NMT architecture, which used word embeddings, but you scored it with these string matching based metrics. And now you have embedding or word vector based metrics, which you can use to uh, score an MT output. So there's a convergence between the operating principle of modern MT systems and um, the, the quality score, uh, the quality metrics you use to, to measure the output of these systems. Okay. So first some housekeeping. I ran this cell already. It's just for, for back. You need to do some background stuff to set up the notebooks uh, properly. But you'd have to run this cell here first. Always check for the look out for the green check mark that the sun has, uh, cell has been um, run successfully. Um, then we start with string matching based metrics. And we note here that for a full understanding of these string matching based metrics, particularly blue, there are some other concepts you need to be familiar with uh, precision recall and particular the engram concept, which Leif was also talking about uh, this morning. And we didn't want to overcrowd this notebook. So we created a companion notebook for automatic MT quality version metrics based on string matching, which you could work through if you will really want to understand the nuts and bolts of these scores. So how they work in detail. So we provide a lot of detail here, but to get the full picture, you would first have a look at the companion notebook and then continue with the main notebook here. Then we have a section on BLEU, bilingual ev evaluation understudy. It's quite famous in our industry, heavily criticized, but it's still there. Um, I won't go into detail here. The nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks I want to um, highlight is that you can include MathJax notation, which is a, well, a language for including mathematical notation in, the, in these notebooks, which is quite a nice Quite a nice feature here. And this is the Bleu formula. It looks much more complicated than it actually is. So we have a detailed explanation of how Bleu works, what the individual parts of this uh, equation actually do. And again, it's if you've understood it, it's, it's quite simple, actually. This looks more, more daunting, much more daunting than it actually is. We link to different uh, papers here. We, yeah, we install uh, the, a package which is called Sacre Bleu. 
um, which is a nice play on words, and which is the official blue package for um, official MP quality evaluation uh, campaigns. They use Sacre Bleu to, to compute blue scores for the output of the different systems to be evaluated. So we just run this cell to get, oh, sorry, to get Sacre Bleu to pull it into our notebook environment. Where am I? There we are. Check mark is green, so we imported Sacre Bleu. And then we have here a short example where we define a hypothesis. Remember, hypothesis always refers to the machine translation output. You could also call this candidate. And reference is our human reference translation. So say our MT system, DeepL, whatever, produced the output. I drove the automobile to the gasoline station. And our human reference translation says, I drove the car to the gas station. Note, we do not use the, the, the source text here. Blue also only compares two target language strings with one another. And then we can run this cell to compute a blue score for this. And we get you get a lot of information here. I won't go into detail because we don't have too much time. We always have a very detailed and explicit explanation of what you see here in the code section following uh, the actual code cells. I will just point out here we have a blue score for this pair of 27.05. Now, blue sc scales from 0 to 1 or from 0 to 100. Um, and blue is a similarity measure. It measures the similarity between two strings. And the closer to 1 or to 100 you are, the, the higher is the similarity between the, the strings. And remember, we want to have a high similarity between our MT hypothesis and the human reference translation. So 27.05 on a scale from 0 to 100 is a pretty bad blue score. So you, if you interpret blue, uh, this blue score here for this example pair, you would come to the conclusion that this is actually a rather bad translation. But if you look at what happened here, we actually, it's the same meaning which is in, uh, expressed in the two strings. We just have two synonyms. We have car and automobile, and we have gas st station, and we have gasoline station. And this serves to illustrate what I said before. Blue, uh, et cetera, the string matching based metrics, then they can only, only capture formal similarity um, and not semantic similarity between two strings. So a rather low blue score for this pair, indicating that this is a low MT quality, which you could argue it actually isn't. But from the perspective, from the working principle of blue, it is a bad uh, MT output we're scoring here. So you could, we have here a section, your own example. You could either change the strings here and write your own the example sentence and run the cell again, and then you'd compute your own blue score. You could do that, but um, this code is closely tied to this documentation. We we comment on these exact examples here. So what you could also do is you could just run this cell below your own example. If you run this cell, then you're asked here to enter a machine translation sentence of your choice. I'll just say, how old are you? Question mark. Then I press enter, then I'm asked to enter human reference. This would be, what is your age? Again, and now I re need to run the cell below to calculate a blue score for this pair. The score is even lower. We are at 10.68 on a scale from one uh, from zero to 100. And again, the semantics is almost identical, but they're formally completely di different. The only exact string matching we have here is the, the question mark, which is identical in the two strings, right? Semantic similarity, formal dissimilarity, blue will score this uh, pretty poorly. Then we have another well, famous or well-known uh, string matching based metric, which is called TER or translation edit rate. Translation edit rate is a distance measure. It's uh, based on uh, Levenstein or edit distance. And it, it measures the dissimilarity between two strings. And in this case, you have also values between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100. And here, the higher the score, the higher the dissimilarity between the, the two strings, meaning you, you don't want a high TER score because it indicates that the MT output is very different from the human gold standard reference translation. So with blue, the higher the blue score, the better. With TER, the higher the TER score, the worse, or the lower the TER score the better. So you always need to know 
something about the operating principle of these scores in order to be able to 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 interpret them also relative to each other if you want to compare blur scores scores with tr scores you need to know how these are actually calculated and interpreted tr is quite simple you have string a which is your empty output and then you could post edit this MT output and this final post edited version would for example be your human reference translation and once you've done that you compare the two strings and you you just count the number of substitutions insertions deletions and shifts you have performed on the MT output while post editing in order to transform it into your final post edited target text and you just divide it, uh, this uh, the number of op editing operations through the length of the reference translation in order to normalize uh, this score. You can do this based on words or based on characters. We're using word-based translation edit right here. Again, we run this cell to install the Python package, which we need here. If I'm not mistaken, Sacre Bleu also has a TR translation edit rate scoring function. So we could also have used this. Now we're using the Python package, which was programmed by Bram Van Roy, who, who's in Leaf's team uh, at Ghent, if I'm not mistaken. So we got the green check mark. We have again our short example. I drove the automobile to the gasoline station. I drove the car to the gas station. We run this. Um, and we get a TR value of 0.25 scale is from zero to one the lower the score the better the trans uh, the translation quality so from a tr perspective the translation is actually quite good because if you look at what do we have to do to change the hypothesis to the reference we just have to substitute uh, car for automobile and gasoline for gas so we just have to perform two shift operations and we have one two three four five six seven eight we divide two by eight two editing operations divided by the length of the reference and two by eight is 0.25. This is the score we get here. So we could all already be quite confused. Blue said it's a bad translation. TRR says it's a good translation. This happens quite often. These scores have different operating principles. So you arrive at different different scores. And remember, human quality validation remains the ultimate gold standard, but it's time consuming. It, it costs money. So if you want to have quick MT evaluations, you, you can rely on these automatic metrics. Again, you could change the strings here, or you could run the cell below your own example. Let's run this and repeat the example from above. Enter. Enter, and then we run the cell below. And here you see again, we get a high TR score, scale is zero to one. The lower the score, the better the MT quality. For this example, TR says this is a bad translation. Again, we have the phenomenon, we have the exact same meaning, or basically the, the exact same meaning, but uh, formally expressed very differently in, 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 in formal terms. And TR is also not able to, to measure this. So we have TR of 0.8, which is a bad TR score. And if we go back above, we had um, a very low blue score. And very low blue score also says that this is a bad translation. So they can differ between themselves in some examples. But uh, the, the common thread here is that they cannot measure semantic similarity. Right, so then we move on to embedding based metrics, in particular BERT score and commit. And these embedding based metrics, as the name implies, they use word embeddings or word vectors. These were mentioned in the in the great introductory video, which Leif showed us this morning. We have um, a separate companion notebook for embedding based MP quality metrics where you can load a word embedding model, query it, you, you can give the give it natural language words, it will it will um, calculate word vectors for you. You can can compare compare the the word vectors of, of similar of different words. You can um, produce visualizations. So if you want to know more about these embedding based metrics, first have a look at this notebook, which is I think it's quite interesting, and does a good job. And then move on 
with uh, the present notebook here. We cover two scores. Bird score relies only on computing semantic similarity between word vectors in vector space. And then we also cover commit further down, uh, which relies both on semantic similarity in vector space, but additionally includes human quality judgment, prior human quality judgment man, judgments. Um, um, performed on a particular training corpus. Comet is, is quite complex. Uh, I mentioned this uh, later. Just have a let's have a look at BERT score. BERT score is based on BERT, which is a large language model uh, developed by Google in 2019. This was the first language model implementation of the transformer, if I'm not mistaken. So you had the transformer in 2017 for neural machine translation, and then they started using parts of this trans uh, transformer, the, the encoder part of the transformer informs language models such as BERT, the decoder part of the transformer informs language models such as GPT. Um, so you have this nice picture, which Leif also showed us this morning. Basically, you have again, uh, they call it candidate, we call it hypothesis. You have an MT output, which is called, it, it is freezing today. You have a human refer reference translation. The weather is cold today. Today, You look up the contextual word embeddings of these candidate and reference translations. So you look up the word vectors of the individual words in uh, the bird language model. Then you calculate the cosine similarity between the word vectors, which is just a mathematical way of establishing how, what, how similar two vectors are. And if the vectors are similar, they're close in vector space. And this would mean that the words represented by these vectors, they're actually similar in meaning. So this is what this pair. You can also use Euclidean distance. This uses pairwise cosine similarity, whatever, just a measure to uh, establish the similarity between wave vectors. Then you compare the different similarity scores with each other and look which where the scores are highest. And then you calculate well, you calculate two uh, three scores. You calculate a bird recall score, a bird precision score, which we didn't cover here. And then you combine them in a bird F measure score. Um, and have a look at our companion notebook on, on string matching based notebooks where we cover precision recall and F measure. And basically this bird F measure score is, is the final bird score. We explain this in quite some detail here, but I know it's, it's, it's a somewhat more complex topic than the string matching based metrics. We install bird score. I didn't run this cell previously on purpose just to show you these new metrics there. In principle, they're more powerful than the older generations, but you saw Bur um, TR and Bleu, they were installed just in two seconds because it's just some, some very simple algorithms you have to import there. These embedding-based notebooks, they rely on large language models, for example, on BERT or on, on other models. And these models, they are more cumbersome to load because they're bigger. Okay, we have 22 seconds here, but still uh, TR and, and Bleu were there in, in mere, mere seconds. And if you work with these embedding-based scores, they're more demanding in terms of computing power and, and processing time. Short example, again, our hypothesis reference pair from above. We define hypothesis reference and push this through the bird score function. And again, you'll notice that it takes considerably longer to compute a score um, than for the TR in blue. And now we will see whether bird score is able to measure the semantic similarity as opposed to the formal similarity between these strings. So it's still running. Bird score also scales between zero and one, and it is interpreted as a similarity measure, meaning the higher the score, the better the translation quality. So there we are, we get three scores, but we only need, so we get bird recall, bird precision, but the combined score is bird score F measure, so we get a value of 0 0.86, 0, oops, 0 0.87 on a scale from 0 to 1. So bird score says this is actually quite good translation because it can measure semantic similarity between these two strings, which is high, right? But they differ formally. And we had, more, we had worse scores for, for both Bleu and TR in this, in this example. 
So what is very convenient, BirdScore has a plot function where you can visualize what you just uh, can visualize the, 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 the pairwise cosine similarity between the word vectors. Just takes a second to run. And you get this similarity matrix where you can see, for example, it, we take automobile, you match it uh, against the vector of I drove the car, etc., and you see the highest uh, matching rate is between automobile and car, and the same would hold for gas and gasoline. Let me check. There is ga gasoline, you match it against all the words in the reference sentence, and the highest match is between gasoline and gas. So you can see the word vectors are quite similar, so you have a high similarity score for the two word vectors, meaning the semantic similarity between the words represented by these vectors is quite high. Again, we have our own example here. I can run this cell again. We repeat our example. How old are you? What is your age? Run this cell again. Again, it takes a bit more time to compute. And now our combined bird score F measure is 0.6, yeah, 0 0.69 again, scale from zero to one. So again, it's it's a it says it's a good translation, right? So we didn't get a really high value, but it's not below 0.5. So it again um, can indeed can measure the semantic similarity between the two the two strings. And also, if we want, we can visualize the plot for our own example. Right, there you go. So I hope the, the basic difference between these string matching based metrics, blur and TR, and these embedding based metrics for now only blur score has become clear by the, the examples we used and the values we calculated. Now it gets difficult, commit is a difficult metric and it's, uh, it's difficult to implement sometimes. Commit uses semantic similarity plus human quality judgments and commit uses a, bi a multilingual uh, model. With BERT score, you can only use uh, one, you can use different language versions of BERT and compute BERT scores for English, for German, etc. but you can only use one language. You can't, so we also only have the uh, target language MT output and the target language reference translation. And Comet uses um, models with a multilingual vector space. And you can see this here. These are the different commit models. They change all the time. But you can see you, we feed commit not only the reference translation, and translation here means the machine translation, meaning the, the hypothesis or the candidate, but you also feed it the source text. So you feed it the, the source text and then the two target language texts. And, Comet has this multilingual vector space. And so you have, if two words or sentences are similar in meaning across languages, then Comet maps them into a single vector space where again, similar words or sentences cluster together across different languages. So you have a more complex model underlying, but you can also feed it more information based on which it can calculate its scores. Um, and then here we have, um, the graphic is a bit difficult to read. We have detailed explanation below here. But here you see this is a so-called quality estimation model. And quality estimation works without a reference translation because so there is no reference which would tell you uh, that this is a good translation or a bad translation. Here you only feed it the source sentence or the source text and the machine translated hypothesis. So again, two different language versions, but you have only the source sentence and then the machine translated sentence. And then you ask the model to estimate the quality of this machine translation without having access to a reference translation, which would actually tell you how this works. So this quality estimation is a very interesting implementation of Comet. And I think, yeah, we're, we're also, we're already at the end of the session, it, it takes quite long to load these models and they're, they're more difficult to interpret than um, the scores we discussed previously. But just, to, you can run this yourself. This is notebooks quite stable. It, it should work when you work through it yourself. So just to reiterate again, the difference between 
commit and uh, the bird score was that we have a multilingual vector space. We can feed it information from different languages, i.e. source text, hypothesis, and reference translation, or only source text and um, MT output in case of quality evaluation. And then you have this uh, additional, they're additionally trained on human quality judgments. And it's interesting if you use, if you look at very fine grained differences between an MT output and a post edited sentence, for example, um, if you render explicit source sentences or explicit MT output more explicitly, or if you fix word order according to function sentence perspective. So these really high level nuanced differences between uh, MT output and a final post edited translation, then you see in the commit scores that commit is actually able to capture these fine grained nuance, nuance differences, probably because it is trained on these additional human quality judgments. So from what you see, Comet is one of the most uh, high performing uh, automatic MT quality metrics out there. It has a lot of potential to capture these nuance differences. It The base models change all the time and implementation can be really difficult. These are the downsides and you have to work with large language models, which, which you have to implement all the time. But the potential in Comet is really high. To, to become the standard MT quality automation metric. I think that was it. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, um, Professor Krüger and also Andre um, for your presentation, also to get an insight into the analyzation and the metrics for MT quality evaluation. I think we gave a good overview of the, of the data lit MT project, the different learning resources. What should have become clear is that, especially for these uh, rather technical topics, we try to prepare a, a strong didactic scaffolding, meaning we have this detailed documentation sec sections in the notebooks, which always tell you what the code does, how the scores calculated by the codes are to be interpreted. We have these companion notebooks where we also spell out everything in uh, in, in more detail. We have we have papers. So we always try to, to cover these topics in a in a very explicit way. Uh, this was one of the didactic um, principles we followed in the in this project so that ideally you could walk through these resources or work through these resources in an uh, in an autonomous way i can't shake the feeling i mean all this is overshadowed by the new gpt models which uh, we were working on the on our learning resources we knew our competence descriptors we knew which resources we wanted to create and then chat gpt came uh, was published in i think it was in november but then it, it took some months to 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 gain traction and now yeah the world's a different place we have new technologies where we have to see how they they can improve or how they can um, how they can uh, further automate uh, automate different tasks of translation how you could interface chat gpt or other gpt models in, in trados or in other translation production systems how you could inter interact with these systems we, we had used this brockman from vienna here i don't know if he's still there he's working on um, uh, using uh, speech technologies in machine translation post editing and uh, with these gpt models you could you can uh, interact with these models in in completely different ways in in the sense i said this this morning hey chat gpt i don't like this term please replace this term by this term in the entire target text and then chat gpt would transform the entire target text according to your prompt so we have this new me this new technological means to automate uh, subtasks of translation we have new ways of interacting with these technologies and all this needs to be research i mean i don't want to devalue what we did with data lit mt i think this is a great preparation if you work through this you have a good understanding of how neural machine translation works from there it's just a small step to the gpt models you have a good understanding of the role data placed in place in uh, in data driven machine translation and data is also the 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 raw material which fuels the gpt models but there are these new these new aspects coming up interesting research questions and um, yeah we want to tackle these in the future uh, 
I don't know. So we're kind of in this in-between phase right now where a new powerful technology is there. Research starts pouring out. There's a lot of papers on ChatGPT, but we don't have a clear picture yet on, on uh, of how this will in, uh, affect us and how this will affect translation automation in the future, how this will affect um, interaction with these new technologies. So it's interesting times, but yeah, also challenging times. I don't know, Janisa, Andrea, do you want to add something? Um, I think it's, yeah, we've already explained a lot. Um, sort of as we were presenting the resources, of course, there's always more time that we could need to present them and to walk through them and talk more about them or more about new developments. Um, yeah, as everything is constantly developing and changing, but I think sort of um, yeah, the takeaway from here is that we've really tried to, as Ralph said, um, establish these resources in a way that they can be didactically followed as well or as clearly as possible, and then hopefully provide some more understanding to ideally also be able to learn um, or work with them if a few things change or, you know, if they work with a different version um, because something has been updated or because something has been developed. Um, just to sort of provide more understanding um, of these resources, these aspects of machine translation, um, you know, working more with data and um, just that we hope that they can be useful, uh, especially, you know, that um, whether they're used in, in the classroom or personally for personal interests, um, we really hope that they can sort of serve to um, help understand or just to, you know, try it out, play around with it, try working with your own data um, using these resources and hopefully sort of gain some more interested, uh, some more interest in this topic in general, because as, uh, well, everyone was saying today who was presenting how important it is to become more sort of data literate and to learn and know how to work um, with data, um, especially within the field of machine translation or translation in general. Um, we hope to have sort of, yeah, provided something something helpful here. Um, but I, yeah, that's that's about it from from my side. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, we talked a lot today, so maybe uh, <laughs> the other participants they want to contribute something or add something or uh, ask further questions on on what we did or what's your take on ChatGPT? Anything you like. You can also unmute yourself if you want, or also can turn on, turn on your cameras. Perhaps there are also some questions left from the practical sessions because we didn't have that much time to take any questions. Doesn't seem so. Um, maybe then um, our networking sessions would be in 15, 20 minutes or so. So there's one question from uh, Gabriella mm -hmm. in, in the chat. Yes. Oh, yeah. Gabriella, would you like to come in or should I read it out? Okay, I'll read it out then. Um, are you planning to organize online courses for the students who might be interested in having a better understanding of neur neural machine translation? Uh, yeah, not in the nearest future because all the project members they already have their hands full with uh, with uh, yeah. other tasks. Um, we there is an um, application for an Erasmus Plus consortium underway, which would uh, follow up on on multi-train NMT. And by the way, the multi-train NMT resources are excellent resources for uh, delving into neural machine translation. So we feel that data lit MT complements um, multi-train NMT by going a bit deeper into certain subtopics that multi-train NMP already covers. For example, they have this nice um, graphical user interface where you can train your own MT systems and, and perform quality evaluations. And you also see the subworded output, which you have to de-subword. And we've 
take these different components and put more focus on on subwording, desubwording, how this works, how these scores are calculated. So we feel we're, we're complementary to the multi tray NMT project. So head over to multi tray NMT. They have great resources. Head over over to our resources. There is a consortium in the planning which uh, tries to build on multi-train NMT and, and develop further digital resources for, for training uh, for training translators. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there and we only complement them by what we did in the project. Are there any other questions? Also, there's the, the DigiLing uh, website I posted in the chat, which is um, an Erasmus Plus project with, which uh, developed a full <laughs> curriculum for a digital humanities program. We also have Python programming, uh, natural language processing, etc. They have a course on, on post editing, so on the linguistic side of machine translation. This may also be something you, you want to have a look at. <laughs> 